So I had to get on the internet. I was in London, and has anybody been to London? Oxford Street, great place, a lot of shopping there, you know, my wife loves it. And go down and I find this internet cafe, it's really fancy, they got a DJ, they got music, they got drinks, really cool. So the guy signs me a computer in the corner. I get logged on and I'm, you know, doing some stuff and look and I look right in the middle of the browser bar. It says, hacked by Godzilla. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, that was an IE, Internet Exploder, right? So I open Firefox, boom, hacked by Godzilla. So I go to the guy that's been running the actual internet cafe. I say, hey, you got a problem, let me show you. He comes over there, he brings over his DVD and puts it in, scans, nothing found. It says, nothing found, dude. I'm like, dude, it says hat by Godzilla. It shouldn't say that. So he goes, I don't know, I'll call corporate. So he calls corporate. Gets done talking to corporate, comes over, brings his DVD, puts it in, scans, nothing found. Nothing there. I'm like, you need to take this machine off and do forensic analysis on it because something's in memory and this thing's been compromised. Wouldn't do it. It's probably still compromised. So if you ever go over there, you'll find a hat by Godzilla machine. Huh? <laughs> so anyway, as I said, I didn't have a laptop, lost all my uh, passport, all that type of stuff. But anyway, I got to fly. And I got into San Francisco, taught all day. And I went and I said, wow, I need to get on the internet still. I hadn't had a time to buy a computer yet. Huh? So I go into FedEx, I think they're called Kinko's today, whatever, that type of thing. I go in there and I get on a computer. It's been a long day. i just flown in from London to San Francisco. And I'm typing away. And I'm like, hacked by Godzilla. There it is again, hacked by Godzilla. <laughs> Wait a minute, I was in London, I'm in San Francisco. This is hacked by Godzilla. I'm squeezing my eyes. I'm saying, this can't be true. This cannot be hacked by Godzilla. <laughs> so I bring that guy over there and he scans it. Nothing found. But finally, I convinced them. I said, hey, man, I'm a consultant. I know this for a living. So they did finally take that one offline. So I got curious. So I got on the internet, hung out with the hacking group for a little bit, and found out Godzilla brags on IRC that he has over 1,000 of these internet cafes around the world compromised with malware that won't be detected by antivirus, which is what we've been talking about all along. Yeah? And that's exactly what we're going to talk about here with memory forensics. We're going to do the basics, right? Not going to spend too much time on this. Traditional forensics is what? Pull the plug, stall right blocker, do your imaging. Yeah? Okay, good. Enough said of traditional. Live is where it's at to me. The reason it's at where it's live is every talk we've seen, did you see anybody saying they were going to write to the file system? Nope. It's all in memory. Everything's in memory today. Okay? Traditional, don't have all your data, right? Presence of malware invalidates and weakens your evidence admissibility. This is kind of how I got into forensics because some of you have heard I was uh, on a project to give internet access to ships at sea. What a crazy concept that was, 1993 I think it was. So we gave internet access to ships at sea, yeah? Where are sailors and marines going to go after 90 days of being at sea with no land? <laughs> I got a crash course in forensics. What are they going to do when they read Hacking Exposed? They're going to try to do it and get away with it, right? Those types of things. So all the way back then, I'm doing all of this forensic stuff, and it's live memory forensics, but like I said, I wasn't smart enough to actually tell anybody about it, so here I am today. Okay. When you get a blue screen of death on the box, how do you proceed in traditional forensics? You pull the plug, you take the image. Well, what was in RAM that caused the blue screen? Right? Memory. We're all talking about memory here, and I'm going to talk about what's happening in the UK and happening a lot, right? Thing what you want to do is capture your RAM and what we call the process antecedents. Uh, now I'm going to play professor because I teach for University of Maryland too. What is antecedents? Parent-child relationship. Almost all your yeah, big work. Almost all your processes do what? Spawn. So who's their parent? This is going to be very important as we get further in here. Okay. Everything we've talked about comes remote. So what are the connections or your netstat command going to show you? Should show you the connections going across. Sean's talk, the first talk of the day, talking about the different tools to look at the malware, all the sophisticated malware. All of them were communicating. Well, you're going to see that in memory if you take a memory image. You will see the ports open by the process. All right? And then you got your handles, registry, all kinds of cool stuff. Okay. This is what's happening in the UK, and it started in 2003. And 15 years ago, on a military case, that all I can do is say it was a military case. Can't talk any more about it other than the fact that I was the investigator. We didn't take live memory. And the judge said, hmm, 
Could there have been a Trojan on the machine? Could I say yes or no? We didn't have live memory. Nobody took live memory 15 years ago. Didn't matter to the military or the government, right? So the actual perpetrator walked. Got off, yeah? Good thing was I was in the military. What happens in the military? They don't fire you. You're not that lucky. They don't fire and kick you out. They write you a bad evaluation and you got to recover from it, right? Which I made chief and ever since I recovered of it. Now, this judge decided that a suspect could claim a Trojan conducted an attack and then after the attack it erased itself. Possible. It's possible. Yeah? The jury agreed and he was acquitted. That was the first one where we've seen it happen and it worked. Now guess who's the most popular judge in the UK if you've got a child pornography case or something you want to look? When? This judge who's allowed this Trojan defense theory, right? He did it again. Cleared another guy after 11 Trojan programs were found on the suspect's computer. Now, in all fairness, the Trojan could be malicious and could have been planted and they could have been framed, right? But if we don't have the memory image, we can't say anything. Okay. This is the one that really frustrated me because anybody, I should ask the disclaimer, anybody with the Scotland Yard? Yeah? If you are, well, you can talk to me offline and get mad at me, but that's fine. Okay? Well, I met with them about, this is July 2009, I met with them about March of 2009. Because I was telling them, hey, you guys need to take live memory and follow a process and methodology to take live memory. Oh, yeah, yeah, Kevin, we do that. Yeah, it's in our policy, it's in our process, it's in our procedures. I get contacted after this happens here in July, and they're like, hey, we need you to come in and talk to the investigator because the perpetrator has said... A Trojan was on my machine and did everything, all right? So I said, okay, so the investigator, I'm talking to him, did you take live memory? No. Wait a minute, I just met you guys in March and you told me it was policy and procedures to take live memory. They're like, no, we didn't take it. Guess what? If I don't have the memory, can I defend the fact that a Trojan could have done all this damage? Very difficult, right? There's possibilities I could go in and maybe look for traces of the Trojan or something and say, yeah, there was a Trojan there in the file system, but what's the chances it's going to be in the file system after what you've seen here at Takedown Con? It's not going to be there, right? This guy walked. And this was a huge, huge, huge profile case. And I was really upset with him because I just met with him in March and said, you guys need to take live memory. Oh, yeah, Kevin, we're doing that. We don't want to pay for your training course or your anything consulting. We just, we, we do it. Yeah, right, okay. Now, why do we connect it, right? We collect it because of RAM. How much RAM you got on your systems today? Four gig, eight gig, yeah? Any 16? Yeah, I, yeah, I just waited. Dell just come out with the M4500. David's in the back there with his Alienware with a 16 gig, yeah? Like, woo. And finally, the 15 inch Dell, because that's 17 inch, I'm tired of carrying that around 50 countries a year. That's just too much, all right? So now you can get a 15 inch Dell with 16 gig of RAM. It was 7,000 two months ago, but the new version now is half that price because they got four slots in it. So that's perfect. But that's 16 gig or 2 gig or 4 gig. Yeah? This is what happens. The witness gets on the stand. Anybody ever been a witness or an expert witness? Yeah, good. You get on the stand and the question is, did you take live memory? The answer is no. I'm the prosecutor, right? I get to play prosecutor here. Closest I'd ever be to an attorney, probably. <laughs> As prosecutor, I say, okay, could there have been evidence in memory, in RAM, right? What's the size of RAM? Say two gig on the machine. Could in that two gig of RAM be evidence that could have been in what we call an esculpatory nature? Esculpatory clear somebody of wrongdoing, right? As an expert witness, what can you answer? Possible. It's possible, right? What are you doing when you do forensics or any type of jur jurisdiction, litigation type case? You're trying to cast a seed of doubt. Cast that seed of doubt. Because almost all of the convictions nowadays say, if you believe, will it be beyond a shadow of a doubt? All right? And I don't care how good you are at collecting your evidence, if you collect it in the wrong manner or miss something, it will defeat the strongest evidence. We all know that with the well-famous uh, football player case. All right? <laughs> The way the DNA, the way everything was handled because of no gloves at the crime scene, all that type of stuff, that did what? Weakened the evidence. And that's all you have to do is weaken the evidence in the judge or the jury's eyes. Okay. Memory wasn't taken. It's gone forever. They can't refute it. There's a possibility it could have been in there, right? All right, good. Okay. Shadow of doubt. Volatile data. We all know volatile data. It's anything that won't survive a reboot. Yeah? 
So I'm not going to insult your intelligence. But look at some of what it is. It's process that open the ports, your net bias names that are in cache. Very important, your internal routing. We heard today about all these infections and all these things having to send things out to the internet. A lot of times they got to modify the routing table when their malware is in there to do that. All right, so there'll be things in there for that. And of course, the process memory itself. And then there we go with our netstat command. Everybody remember? Okay, a little bit of TCP. What's the four zeros? Listen on everything, the wild card, right? And the colon 25 is the port. What's the four zeros, colon 25 together? The socket, right? Everybody remember your socket? Yeah, good. Everybody remembers that stuff. It's basic. Cool. This one, some know about, some don't. After Windows XP Service Pack 2, for some reason, Windows didn't tell us about it. I don't know why. That's Windows. Okay? The B option. The B option will give you the path to the executable that opened the process and opened the port. Huh? Is that good information? Yeah, yeah, that's how you will go and find malware on your scene. And what I tell everybody, if you haven't done it, Connect to your favorite, I don't know, anybody likes, uh, I, I say, uh, just say no to Facebook, right? <laughs> just say no to Twitter. You all do what you want to do, that's fine. Okay, I get a lot of investigations from it. Still job security, that's good. All right, go there and then do a netstat-ab and see if anything's open to port that you didn't expect it to to start communicating with somebody. Okay, these are the types of things you want to look like when you're starting to look at memory itself just before you even take a forensic image. All right. As I said, MBT stat will show you the uh, cache net bias names. <laughs> These are some cool little tools, net user, PS logged on. They'll tell you the users currently logged on, those types of things. So if you get there and you do this and you see Hacker Ron or somebody's logged on, we were lucky because it was somebody that was a script kitty and called himself Hacker Ron, right? Okay? Internal routing, everybody remember your R command? Huh? So if we've got a multi-homed host, if we look in the routing table, we would see it in here, yeah? Different things you can do. And in this case, we do have what? We have the 192.168.25 network, and we have the 192.168.220 network. If you look at this and you're doing an investigation and you're like, there is no 192.168.220 network anywhere in this organization, where'd that route come from? Mailware, okay? Different ways of doing different things. Okay. Running processes. We have to get the executable image, command to invoke, the runtime, security context, DLLs and modules, and memories, right? 